Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Women Entrepreneurs Global podcast, Mindset for Success, where we're going to explore tonight the unconscious struggles that female entrepreneurs have had to conquer in order to be successful. I'm your host, Dr. Leslie Knudsen, and I'm so excited to meet and hear from our guest today, Lucia Gallardo. She is truly a leader in the community of women empowering our global future women entrepreneurs. And she has also, in her own words, been working on social justice since she was eight years old. Lucia has a very successful career as a Honduran serial entrepreneur, and she's the founder of Emerge and Tabik, the latter being the community for young entrepreneurs in Latin America. Her latest uh, endeavor is to co-chair the International Advisory Council at Women's Entrepreneurs Global and to lead Women's uh, Global Exponential Technology Division, uh, which I think is further proof of her commitment to promoting women's business and a career advancement. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Lucia Colarto. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Lucia, as you know, it takes a lot to be a successful female entrepreneur, and business acumen is, of course, a critical ingredient. But we rarely talk about the psychological challenges that women often face to achieve that success. And I refer to them as the unconscious struggles that create doubt and undermine success and can destroy self-confidence. So I wonder, Lucia, if you can tell me what made you want to become a serial entrepreneur, and in particular in the world of technology and social inclusion in Latin America, where women are often underrepresented. And I can imagine that your choice to undertake an entrepreneurial journey may have come partially out of your long-term dedication to social justice. However, I imagine it could have also come with some risk for you. Absolutely. I think, you know, it was inevitable that I would end up an entrepreneur, especially a social entrepreneur, as you um, sort of know a little bit about my commitment to social issues. But I think for me, it wasn't necessarily that I said, I want to be, be an entrepreneur, or I want to build a company, or I have a product in mind. For me, it was really this obsession with solving problems um, that led me down this path. And that started, you know, when I was eight and I sort of started slowly, you know, realizing what was going on around me as I was growing up in Honduras and experiencing, you know, firsthand natural disasters and also a lot of the uh, visual inequalities that had become now apparent and, and I didn't understand them. And so in the quest to try to understand them and see if there was anything I could do to help, then um, that sort of turned me on into this world of at least like project management. I didn't know at the time that it would turn into a company or, or anything like that. But, you know, I think uh, over time it was just this commitment to understanding what the issues around poverty and generational poverty um, and wealth inequality and lack of access to basic services like water or education. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to understand all of these things. Um, and so to me it was, you know, I, I, and still to this day, I consider that you can learn to be an entrepreneur. You can learn the business components. You can learn all of these other factors. But in what you call the intangibles, I think for me, a lot of entrepreneurship is really about um, sort of emphasizing what those traits are within you. And so if you are, you know, a naturally problem driven or problem solving person, if you are a collaborative uh, person, if you're very driven, all of these traits they sort of get amplified when you choose to learn to become an entrepreneur. And so I, I find it really fascinating um, that the two come together and the outcome potentially can be something, um, you know, really innovative or, or you know, very uh, positive for the world. So it, it's very much a lit, like my entire life led me here. <laughs> right. In fact, what I was going to say, it's not like you're really thinking outside the box per se. You're just following what has been in, instinctively the, the direction that you've always had which means that there's a certain amount of confidence about doing what you're doing. And yeah. I kind of wonder how, how, I mean, have there been some days in which or dark periods in which that confidence hasn't been there? And if you can tell us a little bit about that, um, sure. because of course it's, 
it's it's sometimes up and down. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think by any means that I would consider myself a confident person per se. I struggle with it a lot. <laughs> um, but I do know, you know, I think a bit of that is understanding that everyone has sources of confidence and sources of, you know, the opposite of, in, let's call it in confidence for now. Um, but essentially, I tried to understand what those sources of confidence in me were. And I was very, I'm very confident about my way of seeing the world. I'm very confident in my ability to empathize and to problem solve in a way that's both, um, you know, creative and innovative, but also uh, humane and mm -hmm. very empathetic. And so I know that those are areas where I do feel like I'm really strong. And then every other area probably maybe <laughs> less so. But so, you know, when I do go through these periods, and there are so many, because, you know, you're constantly trying to build something and and even if you have, have gotten really good at turning the noise down and, and not comparing yourself to other entrepreneurial journeys, the world tries to push that on you. Um, and, you know, and they say like, oh, well, you know, why aren't you making, you know, consistent revenue? And, and why aren't you at this stage or that stage? And why do, haven't you hired a right hand already? And what, you know, and so you're, they're analyzing all of your decisions. And so obviously it could be really terrifying at times to say, do I have it together? I don't, I don't know. What am I, my building is, you know, what am I doing wrong? Is this why this is not working? And so I think there are so many ways in which doubt can sort of come to your mind that I have found it really helpful throughout time to remind myself of the things I do have really strong confidence in. And then even if in that moment, that's not the type of confidence I need, reminding myself that there is a foundation for me being strong and, and me having all these areas of strength. It helps me sort of climb out of that negative negativity and try to figure out ways to problem solve because I'm a good problem solver. And I know that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I've just found it really, really helpful to understand myself to the degree where I know what my foundational areas of confidence are. And even if there's not that many, or it feels like there aren't that many, um, that when I really need to feel positive about myself in, in a different area of my life where I'm not feeling necessarily so confident, then I know that I can resort back and, and adjust the scenario so that it taps into this area of fortitude. Um, and so I, I would hope that, you know, all women and, and all people really are able to find those little areas of, of real confidence where they say, you know what, I am good at this. And, and sometimes that's what you need in order to pull yourself out of that like funk, I guess they call it. And, and how could you share with our young listeners who are out there yeah. and kind of considering going into being an entrepreneur, how could you share with them how you are able to really evaluate and take stock in the confidence that you have? What, what allows that to become real for you? Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting that humans have a natural tendency to assume they know themselves because you are yourself, right? So you just think, mm -hmm. I'm me, so I know myself. But actually, I think the most powerful and empowering thing that we can do for ourselves is to know that, one, we don't know ourselves, you know, unless we are active and intentional about it. And two, I think the other bit of it is that we change constantly. And sometimes things happen to us, good and bad, that adjust our way of seeing life, that adjust the ways that we process things, that adjust our priorities in life. And so we need to be really careful and, and intentional about sort of processing all of those moments and how it makes us different humans as we grow up and mature and change and so on and so forth. So I think the best advice I could impart and that it took me a really long time to learn was, you know, if you, when you're learning, and you, you know, decide that you're going to learn about a topic you didn't know about, the first step that you need to do is figure out how you're going to learn it. Is it, you know, are you going to take a course on it? Are you going to YouTube it? Are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to read a book about it? Mm -hmm. And so you need to find these ways and apply them to yourself. So for me, um, you know, when I said, okay, I need to learn about myself, I started by reading a couple of books on, you know, building self-awareness and on, you know, designing um, sort of your goals and your objectives and things like that. And then I started applying a lot of those techniques that I was applying in my work when mm -hmm. I was trying to build a product or trying to solve a problem. I started applying them internally. So I started saying, okay, well, you know, I'm going to mind map. I'm going to try mind mapping because I know that's a very powerful thing when I'm trying to problem solve. I break down all these different problems and learn more about them. And so I said, okay, so what are the key pillars of my life? And I said, it's, you know, work and family and friends and, and uh, you know, my personal curiosity and, and how I want, what I want to learn about the world, um, my mental and physical health. And so I broke all of those down and tried to figure out where I stood. 
And then I started doing this more regularly. I would do it maybe like five or six times before setting any kind of resolution for the new year, before setting any kind of major goals. And the more that I sort of got to know myself through these processes, the more I discovered what those areas of strength are and what those areas where I needed to work on were. And so I know, you know, I learned that even though I'm, let's say, a very generous person, I lack a little bit of discipline. So I need to be very intentional about channeling, you know, a bit of generosity into the, you know, time and effort that I put into into building discipline. And so in learning, for example, you know, that famous resolution of I'm going to go to the gym five times a, a week. Right. Right. Um, but we do that because, you know, it's an expectation that we're like, you know, you should be healthy. And so you should go to the gym, right. and, you know, right. whatever. And, and a lot of times that's not why we want to go to the gym. Right. We want to go to the gym for a specific reason. It might be to lose weight. Sure. But actually for, in my case, it was because I wanted to build strength. I wanted to feel like a strong woman. Mm -hmm. And so going mm -hmm. to the gym and running on a treadmill wasn't going to make me feel strong, which is why I wasn't sticking to that habit. But right. when I would do right. activities like boxing or like Krav Maga, that would make me feel really strong. I'd be very consistent because it was tapping into this real, real me that I didn't, I wasn't even aware about had I not taken the time to learn about myself. So I think the advice is, you know, we, as uh, the way that we apply learning and the way that we um, sort of look at the world externally, we can also put those practices in to ourselves and, and be generous with ourselves. And so it's really helpful to build that awareness. I think that's helpful. Just trying to be, to make things concrete and not overwhelming and break them up into little pieces. Yeah, totally. And um, sometimes you don't have the bandwidth to like, go through all of those things you know sometimes I would only look at mental or physical health or sometimes I would only look at work because that's all I had bandwidth for but over time and the more that you practice the better you get at just knowing yourself and then once you you have these like areas of self-awareness then you know you know areas that might be your gap areas or that you might want to work on or maybe you don't want to work on them at all and just right. if you don't find people that, that can fill that gap for you or um, you know, maybe it's something that you realize is actually a very big strength of yours. And then that's what you resort to when you are feeling, you know, like right. it's a down moment. Let me kind of switch it up a little bit and ask you, have you noticed in your work as an entrepreneur, what you feel is a mindset that strength, that is a mindset strength among men and perhaps a weakness among women? And have you dealt with that in your own sort of personal interactions, business interaction? Yeah, I think there's there's like two things that have particularly stood out for me in relation to when I'm actually aware that there's a difference between genders. Um, one of them is uh, this, like the the entire strategy around pricing. I think re women really struggle to find the right pricing strategies as entrepreneurs. We often mm -hmm. undersell ourselves. We often undersell our products and our companies. And I think men struggle less to do that. And it might be a confidence thing. Maybe it's a, you know, a direct experience with pricing things in, in previous professional roles or something. Um, but there definitely is, you know, and I've made this mistake often. I've underpriced myself significantly and I still struggle with it. Actually, a couple of uh, days ago, I had a phone call with a friend who said, wait, how much are you charging for your consulting? Um, and I gave her the number and she said, you need to multiply that by four. That's what I would expect mm -hmm. to pay for you. And mm -hmm. I said, by four? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's insane. Mm -hmm. I can't, I, I don't see myself charging by four, you know, multiplied by four. Um, I'd feel guilty about it. And that's, I think that's, something that we really need to lean into is understanding, you know, how to price ourselves with a lot more confidence because it actually backfires. Like being the cheapest option might make you seem like you're less quality of a consultant or less quality of an anything. And so I think in this way, it's definitely been an area where it's obvious that there's a disparity. And I think that women need to start getting a little bit stronger and myself included. I'm definitely preaching to myself here and saying, you know, finances can be so difficult for women for all the things you talked oh about. Oh my God, you, yes. Feeling greedy, feeling like you're not worth it, and being yeah. um, even kind of ashamed to ask for too much, you know. And Absolutely. So, okay. I was in a, I was in a meeting the other day with a, a group of women entrepreneurs who were pushing out a new product. And, you know, they said, we want to do this course or whatever. And, and they were describing the course. And I said, great. So you're going to, your pricing is going to start at $2,500 per course. And they looked at me and they said, what? No, we were thinking like 300. And I said, 300, I know exactly what other people charge for this. And it's not $300. Mm -hmm. So it is a tendency, very, very much a tendency. The other thing I think is the, the mentality of supporting each other in a way that's a lot less 
verbal or emotional. So Mm -hmm. we as women constantly provide a lot of emotional support for other women entrepreneurs. We understand what they're going through. We try to empathize with it. But the way that men networking circles, which I'm now sometimes a part of, the way they help each other is a lot more directed at building wealth, at closing clients at, you know, all of these ways that are much more tangible outcomes. And I think that, you know, we as women have been really good at building these like support networks, which we drastically need. But I think there has to come a point where we start saying, okay, we've discussed it, we've felt really good about it together, we've empathized, we've, you know, given each other a listening ear. But now that needs to turn into a contract, an agreement, Um, a lead, you know, and I think we are stopping short of of that kind of support. And I think um, I'm really excited about the kinds of networks of women that say, I'm not just going to support you emotionally. I'm here for that. Yes, absolutely. But what I'm really going to do is I'm going to push for you to get that contract in this, you know, in this community that I'm a part of, or I'm going to push to make sure you are the preferred, you know, partner supplier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And that's kind of some of the wonderful ways for, for mentoring, which is, fine emotional support, I'd be the first to tell you it's critical, but you also really need to have the do's and the don'ts. Yeah, totally. And and sometimes that gets clouded over by these unconscious struggles in which it's hard to see them because you're just too wrapped up in, oh my gosh, I can't do it or I don't have enough and to, to be able to do it. So um, yeah, I think I remember once looking at like uh, a list of companies in the blockchain space and I would notice that all of their advisory boards, it was the same people sitting in each other's advisory boards. And then they were all in this like group of friends. And I said, so this group of friends is giving each other equity and supporting each other and giving each other funding contracts, et cetera. And together their companies are growing. And so together they're all building their own wealth. And mm-hmm. so all of them have risen together. And, you know, all of the women in, you know, groups that I was a part of, they were all giving each other, you know, emotional support. And I said, yes, emotional support is super important. I'm a huge advocate for it. And I think Mm -hmm. the world needs a lot more empathy. But what else do we need? Women need access to money. Women need access to contracts. Women need to build their wealth and their the wealth and the power that comes with having more wealth and being able to make investment decisions in being able to uh, grow their companies to higher, you know, profit or to, to bigger exits. So I think that's been something, but I think those two areas in, in, uh, you know, pricing yourself well, and then learning how to help other women build their wealth and contributing to that concretely. I think those two areas are big gaps for us. And I think we really need to work on that collectively. Mm-hmm. I, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Yeah. How has your upbringing made mastering a mindset for its success mm-hmm. easier or harder? Ah, that's a good question. And I actually have I've been thinking about it a lot lately because I've been thinking about my upbringing. I'm currently quarantined in Honduras, so I'm spending a lot of time with my family for the first time in many, many years. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, a big piece of it was understanding how much my parents really gave to me as a, as a young person. Um, they really struck an interesting balance between being there and having some boundaries and saying, you know, uh, there are certain things that you can't do. And there are moments where like, we're going to wait up. If you went out to a party, we're going to wait up until you come home and we're going to talk to you and see if you had fun. But it was always, you know, I was allowed to do a lot of things that many other people weren't allowed to do apparently. So I've come to learn because Mm -hmm. my, my parents also respected a lot of my sovereignty and my autonomy. And so they trusted my judgment a lot. And the fine balance that they struck between saying you are a person that needs to learn how to make good decisions and saying I'm here to listen to your thought process through those decisions. I think that's something that's really, really powerful. I think Mm -hmm. the clearest example was um, when I was uh, 16, I decided that I didn't want to be particularly religious anymore. And so my parents ha- are, are both very much Christian and or Catholic, and they, uh, you know, they maybe now a little bit less so, but they're still internally very faithful. And at the time, it was very much looked down upon, especially in Honduras, to, you know, not be religious, where mm-hmm. 98% of the population is religious. But my parents, they said, okay, if that's the decision that you want to make, then you have to you know, understand why you're making that decision. Because one of my brothers had, you know, said that he was atheist. And so they didn't want me to to lose my faith because Mm -hmm. my older brother had. And so I was Mm -hmm. jumping on his bandwagon. 
So they made me write a paper. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they made me write this paper and it was something like a 12 page paper about why I had taken this decision. And to do that, I, it was a research paper. So I had to read the Bible. I had to speak to a priest and ask questions. And I had to look at, you know, different, mm -hmm. uh, different histories of, of religion and, and make these arguments as to why I decided that, that this was the way that I wanted to move forward with my life. And once I submitted the paper, they accepted the decision. It was just, they wanted me to foster critical judgment. And mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful and example of saying, I respect you. I respect mm -hmm. your judgment, but I'm here for you. And right. I want to understand right. and make sure that I'm guiding you in the direction where you can exhibit that critical judgment always. And so I think that's how it contributed in a very meaningful way. I'm very grateful for it. Great. Um, uh, sort of last kind of quick question. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to women who are mm -hmm. struggling with wanting peer support? Mm -hmm. I think it like it's vulnerability is a two way street. And I think when we go to our friends and our family, sometimes it can be really hard to say that you feel there's a shortcoming where you feel like you failed or you feel like you've, you're going through something that you might not be able to work your way out of alone. I think it's, it, you know, support can, support can only come if you open the doors to let it in, right? Which means that you need to be really brave in being open and finding the people that you know that you can do that with. And so I think I'm a really big fan of cultures of vulnerability because I think the more that we are able to better work through and express how we feel and, and what sort of things are happening in the world as we feel them, I think that is ultimately what leads to greater empathy and what leads to people knowing how to help you. Sometimes if I'm angry or sad, I say, I really need this because mm -hmm. the other person sometimes doesn't know how to deal with that emotion. Mm -hmm. and, and that's normal because we haven't built these kinds of cultures before. So I think it, it's really important to open up to people in a way where you are really expressing that vulnerability, but you're also finding empathy in what they're going through as receivers of your vulnerability and saying, it would be helpful for me if you did this right now. Right. So I think and both of those go also, hand in hand. Yeah. And it will bring you an awful lot of support too, in terms of being able to get yeah. what you want in terms of being uh, going forward with your business, because you know, totally. if you know what you want deep down inside, it's easier to ask yeah. for what you want outside. Yeah. And sometimes you need to vent and just say, you know, I just got out of a client meeting and it was horrible and this is what happened. And sometimes you need a way to reformulate that so that you can go back to that client and say, actually, here's a way that we can work together. So sometimes you need, there's moments where you need both, but it's really helpful to be able to express that and release that to someone that you know is, is you know, helpful or can be helpful because also you've built that practice between you where this person now knows what the be best way to help you is. And it's okay right. to tell them, right now I just need this. And, right. and a person that truly wants to support you will give you just that when you need it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to sort of wrap up and, and say um, thank you so much for, uh, for openly sharing today with our listeners you know, your inspirational psychological journeys, which are always really interesting and articulate and full of great antidotes of what's really sort of been important moments in your life mm -hmm. and which have kind of ta undertaken, um, uh, which you have undertaken to become the successful female founder that you are today. And those of us at Women's Entrepreneurs Global are committed to powering the success of female founders for more information on our guests and this podcast and many other founder programs, please visit womenentrepreneurs.global, which is the first startup studio for women. And part of helping young founders move ahead is for us to facilitate, I think, this open dialogue that we had today that's non-stigmatizing about some common unconscious struggles, such as the fear of failure and not being good enough and that loud, chattering, nonstop internal critic at times to kind of allow women to listen that it's normal and there's ways for you to kind of get overcome that. So for our listeners, um, if, if they, somebody would like to reach out to you, how would you have them reach out to you? Where would you like them to do that? Um, I'm really big on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. So all of those are, are perfectly okay. I go by Lucia Gallardo on LinkedIn and okay. then... Uh, at Gallardo underscore Lucci in, uh, tw on Twitter, and then Lucia.Gallardo on Instagram. So those are all places where I can be, I can be found. Great. So for our listeners, if you have any questions or 
guests we'd like to know, you'd like to know more about our guests or our shows, please contact me at Dr. Leslie Knutson at, at drlesliknutson.com. Thanks so much, Lucia. Thank you very much.